And so, yeah, hi everybody. So uh, I have worked in the physics team uh, of the Welcome Center for Human Your Imaging some time ago. And we will talk during the next 30 minutes about the general linear model. So let's go back to the classical SPM pipeline that is used to make inference on fMRI time series. So the first step was to prepare the data, realign them, normalize them. And now the data have been prepared, we can do the next step, which is trying to fit a model on this data in order to be able to make inference later. So as a practical example, we will use a simple fMRI experiment. So during one session, the subject uh, alternates between period of word listening and resting. There are 12 scans per cycle, and each scan is acquired in seven seconds. So this cycle is repeated seven times. And the typical question of this kind of experiment is, is there a change in the board response between listening and rest? And where does this change occur? So the, the analysis in SPM is performed on each and every voxel. So here is a time series of volume scan in the order of acquisition. And if we take only one voxel on these scans, always the same, we are able to draw the bold signal with respect to time of this voxel. A model is then fitted to this 1D signal and parameters of the model are estimated for each voxel. And eventually a statistical test is performed on each voxel. So which model do we try to fit on this signal? We try to decompose this signal as a linear combination of components. One of the components will be the mean signal, for example. A second one uh, will be the, um, the stimulus that is proposed to the subject. For example, if listening induces a change in the bold signal during the listening block, we expect to see an increase of the signal. And the last term here is the error term. Every other component of the signal, which is not captured by the two regressors in this case, goes to this term. So here, here's the model we apply to our data. The unknowns are the beta coefficient and the error term. Of course, the most interesting parameter is beta one in that case. High beta one value would suggest there is a change in the MR signal during listening block. So basically, we, we always try to fit a model of this shape to our data. The time series of each voxel y um, equals a linear combination of the colon of the design matrix x plus some noise. The colon of this matrix can represent the task design, but also the motion, the physiological regressors, everything that we think can have an impact on the bold signal. Each colon has an impact more or less important in the signal, and this impact is captured by the beta coefficient. All the variance not modeled by the regressors of the z-design matrix goes into the error term. But we assume that this error is normally distributed with a standard deviation of sigma and the correlation matrix equal to the identity matrix meaning that all the terms of this vector are assumed to be independent. So this is the model we try to fit and we try to estimate the beta coefficient. The general linear model is a very flexible framework for parametric analysis, and we can do multiple statistical tests, one sample, two sample, pair t-test, analysis of variance, covariance, correlation, linear equation, multiple regression. So how do we estimate the parameters? Here is our model corresponding to our studies. So only two regressors in the design matrix. Our objective is to minimize the error term so that most of the variance of the series Y is explained by the regressors and not the error term. So the solution of this problem is a famous expression of the ordinary least square estimator. So let's try to explain it from a general metric point of view. So this is the equation of the OLS. Let's try to uh, 
explain it uh, differently. So our data is represented by the y vector. We try to describe y in terms of x1 and x2, the two regressors, the two currents of the design of the matrix, the design matrix. So the design space is a plane corresponding to any linear combination of x1 and x2. And y can be described by a vector in this design space plus another vector, the error term. And there is a unique solution if we want to minimize this error vector. And this vector must be orthogonal to the plane. So mathematically, this means the product of the Z design matrix and the error term is null, and the error term is nothing but the difference between the data and X beta. And you easily obtain the OLS estimator. So the very powerful and flexible concept of GLM needs to be adjusted to the characteristic of our problem. First of all, the board response is not immediate and does not stop right after the stimulus. Second, the MR signal may vary without being associated to the board response. For example, the amplitude of the magnetic field changes over time. It's a very small variation, but it's still significant for a long period of time, like fMRI time series. And bear in mind that the change we are expecting is only of order of 2%, not more. The third issue is the assumption that we have made about the error term. Due to breathing, heartbeat, neuronal activity, which may cause change in the bold signal, but are not modeled, and are included in the error term, the noise model is not valid anymore. So let's try to address all this issue. So it has been shown that the board response related to a neuronal response has this shape. We call it the hemodynamic response function, HRF. We use the following model. Uh, the higher the neuronal response is, the higher the amplitude of the bold response the ball signal is. If the neuronal response is delayed, the HRF is delayed from the same amount of time. And its shape is not changed. If there are two consecutive neuronal responses, the two HRF are added together. And all these properties are captured by the convolution operator. So if we convolve um, the stimulus function with the HRF, we obtain the broad response. So the stimulus, uh, let's take an example. The stimulus function is the red one, the red signal. The acquired signal is actually the blue signal. So you can see that it's a bit delayed and uh, has a different shape from the stimulus function. So the solution, is to convolve the stimulus function, the stimulus regressors of the design matrix by the HRF. And after convolution, we can obtain the green signal, which is much closer to the um, uh, acquired signal. The second issue is due to the slow variation of the MR signal, not related to the bold response we can actually observe a slow decrease of the amplitude in the blue signal. So let's, let's imagine we have acquired the blue signal. We can see that there is a small um, decrease of the signal over time. So this may be regressed out by a high pass filter and applying a high pass filter in this framework is equivalent to, included, to include in the design matrix regressors which vary slowly in time. So the black signal here is actually a linear combination of this additional slow component. This capture well the slow decrease of the blue signal and adding the black signal to the red one, which is the convolved stimulus function, allows us to obtain the green signal that is even closer to the blue signal. So in SPM, we can choose the cutoff frequency of the, fil of the filters and the regressors are automatically loaded. The last issue was about the error term. 
So our assumption about independent error time series is most of the time wrong. Each time point is related to the previous to the previous one, such as the auto-covariance function and the covariance matrix have this shape. So it's not the identity matrix. So this effect increases when the TR is getting smaller. So there, there is temporal correlation. This temporal correlation must be taken into account given that more and more highly accelerated sequences are used. So let's go back to our model. Now the error term has a correlation matrix V. And let's define W as the square root of the inverse of this covariance matrix V. Let's then, let's then apply W in both sides of the model. The autocorrelation matrix of this new error term is now equal to the identity matrix. So the OLS estimator can now be applied to this new model that uh, restores the validity of the hypothesis of independent um, um, term in the error uh, regressor uh, in the in the error term. This solution is called uh, pre-whitening of the data, and it looks simple, but it requires the difficult estimation of V, the covariance matrix. So in SPM, V is estimated as a linear combination of covariance components, Q. If you choose the option AR1 autoregressive uh, model in the SPM design, which is on by default, the covariance matrix V will be estimated as a combination of two covariance components, Q1 and Q2, representing a mixture of an AR1 model and white noise. The hyperparameters lambda are estimated from the data with a restricted maximum likelihood estimator. So bear in mind that a unique set of hyperparameters are estimated, is estimated for one time series, and it's not voxel specific. So for TR below 1.5 seconds, this model may not be sufficient. It is then recommended uh, to use more components to be able to capture temporal correlation with a longer lag. And the flexibility of the restricted maximum likelihood enable the use of more components of any shape. So let's summarize this. SPM is uh, using a univariate approach. So each voxel is treated separately. Um, a GLM is fitted to the time series in order to estimate the coefficient beta. The GLM is a very general approach, so the model must be adapted to our current problem fMRI analysis. So first, stimulus regressors must be convolved with the HRF. Data must be high pass filtered, and the temporal correlation must be taken into account. So if we go back to our initial data set, each time series of every voxel is decomposed in several components, including the stimulus, the mean, and many others if we want. So in order to accurately estimate the parameters, temporal correlation must be taken into account. Data can be pre-whitened. This comes down to use is a weighted least square approach to estimate the beta coefficient. And for each voxel, a set of beta coefficients is estimated, as well as a standard deviation of the error term. So now we want to address the initial question. Is there an activation during listening? We can now run the statistical test to evaluate if the data of the stimulus regressors is significantly different from zero in some region. The T-score here is computed as follows, and you can see that it requires a good estimation of beta and its standard deviation. So a T-score is obtained for each voxel. So at the end, a T-score map uh, can be analyzed. So high T-score suggests a high probability of an activation. And here we can observe high T-score in the auditory cortex, which makes sense given the type of stimulus. And you will see the details of the stats in the next presentation. 
I thank you very much. 